Membranes and Transport Part 1. In this video, we'll look at the structure of membranes. The importance of membranes. Cell membranes surround all organelles other than the ribosomes. For the sake of simplicity, in this video, we'll discuss mainly the cell membrane that surrounds the entire cell. So what is the importance of the cell membrane? Well, it separates internal cell reactions from the external environment. That means that the cell is sort of like a self-enclosed little vessel where reactions can take place, their rate can be controlled, what gets produced can be controlled, and so on. The cell membrane can also control the movement of materials into and out of the cell. It can allow certain materials to pass right through it, it can prevent certain materials to pass through, and it can also control the rate at which certain materials pass through it. The structure of the cell membrane. The cell membrane is a flexible matrix of phospholipid molecules in which proteins are scattered. The phospholipid bilayer is formed by phospholipids, which are polar. They have a hydrophilic end and a hydrophobic end. The hydrophilic end is the head which forms the outer face of the phospholipid bilayer. And the hydrophobic tails point toward the inside of the membrane and so you get this double layer of phospholipids. Membrane features permeability. If something is permeable it allows the passage of all substances through it. So if we had uh, a cell membrane that was completely permeable all materials could pass freely in and out of it. A semi-permeable membrane allows the passage of some molecules through it. And the reason for this might be something as simple as the size of the pores within that membrane. So if we took a close-up of this membrane, we might see that it actually has spaces in it that would allow tiny particles to move through, but would prevent larger particles from fitting through. Cell membranes are neither completely permeable nor semi-permeable. Cell membranes are selectively permeable, and this is a property only of living cell membranes. Selective permeability is special because it allows some substances to cross more easily than others and it can control the rate at which they pass. So some materials may move freely in or out. Other materials might move in but the rate would be controlled by the membrane itself. They could also move out and again that would be controlled by the membrane itself or they might just not be able to move into the cell or out of the cell at all. The key here for selective permeability is this part, that the cell can actually control the rate at which materials move in and out. So let's take a look at what types of materials the cell membrane controls. First of all, small uncharged molecules like oxygen and carbon dioxide can easily diffuse across the cell membrane. It's as though the membrane isn't there at all. Water, on the other hand, it can move through the cell membrane, but not all water molecules can move through that easily, and that's because water is polar. The reason that it moves through at all is probably due to the fact that it's a small polar molecule and it may be able to slip between the phospholipids as they bob around. Charged molecules and ions, however, cannot cross the phospholipid bilayer. These would include things like sodium or chloride ions, calcium ions, anything that has a charge. And of course, very large molecules can't slip between the phospholipids, and this would include glucose. Now we know that sodium and chloride and glucose do pass across the cell membrane. It's just that they don't pass through the phospholipid bilayer. Another feature of the cell membrane is all the proteins embedded within it. They're shown in blue. There are three classes of proteins scattered throughout the phospholipid bilayer. They include peripheral proteins, integral unilateral proteins, and integral transmembrane proteins. The peripheral proteins are basically on the surface, either the inner surface or they could also be on the outer surface of the cell membrane. They are hydrophilic, obviously, because the cell is immersed in water on both sides, both on the outside and on the inside. Integral unilateral proteins extend into the membrane, and this would be an example right here. Now, I know that this says peripheral protein, but this actually would be an integral protein because it extends into the membrane and it has a hydrophobic part that aligns itself with the phospholipid tails and 
a hydrophilic end that's actually closer to the edge of the phospholipid bilayer where it's closer to water. We call any kind of a molecule like this that has both hydrophobic and hydrophilic regions amphipathic. The third category of proteins is the integral transmembrane protein and these span across the whole membrane. This would be an example right here. It appears on both the internal surface and the external surface and it goes right through where the phospholipid tails are. And that's because they have hydrophobic and hydrophilic regions. So for example, the sides closer to the water would be hydrophilic and the part closest to the lipid tails would be hydrophobic. Now that we've discussed the three categories of membrane proteins, let's take a look at the specific different jobs of these proteins. The first type is the channel proteins and the transport proteins and they are responsible for moving materials across the membrane. If you recall there are some materials that just cannot move through the phospholipid bilayer and as a result they have to be transported. This might seem like a lot of work but it's what allows the cell to control the rate at which these substances enter and leave. So the first type are the channel proteins and channel proteins provide passageways through the membrane for specific hydrophilic or water soluble substances such as polar and charged molecules. Now since they're moving from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration of that type of molecule this requires no ATP. Transport proteins like the one shown over here may or may not use ATP depending upon if the movement is from an area of higher concentration to lower concentration which would require no ATP or if the movement is from an area of lower concentration to higher concentration which would require ATP. There are three types of glycoproteins located within the cell membrane. Glyco as you may know means sugar and proteins are of course proteins so these are combination sugar proteins and an example of this would be recognition proteins. Recognition proteins have short polysaccharide chains on them that protrude from the surface of the membrane and they distinguish the identity of nearby cells so this would allow cells to recognize each other as being the same type for example cardiac muscle cells or as being different from one another and would also help cells recognize where they may belong in the body. Another type of glycoprotein is the adhesion protein. Adhesion proteins attach cells to each other or provide anchors for internal filaments and tubules stabilizing the cell shape. So here you can see uh, an adhesion protein and there is a ligand that's attaching to it. Another type of glycoprotein is the receptor protein. Receptor proteins provide binding sites for hormones and other trigger molecules and as a result of this a specific cell response results. An example of this not working properly would be in pygmies. Pygmies have faulty growth hormone receptors and so even though they produce enough growth hormone which would fit into the receptor they basically do not have receptors that can actually interact with it. There are other types of proteins as well. One type is enzymes. Enzymes have an active site exposed to substances in adjacent solutions. Sometimes several enzymes may be ordered in a membrane and work as a team to carry out a metabolic pathway. Of course the function of enzymes is to speed up chemical reactions or make it possible for chemical reactions that might not otherwise occur. In the mitochondrial membrane you'll see that there is ATP synthase Proteins can also function as intercellular junctions. So adjacent cell membrane proteins can actually hook together and so uh, basically not only bind the membranes of these cells together but actually provide a passageway whereby cells can actually share materials. Of course there are also electron transfer proteins and these are the proteins that transfer electrons from one molecule to another and here we see the thylakoid membrane of chloroplast and electrons are being passed from protein to protein within the membrane to ultimately result in ATP production. 
Besides proteins, there are also other materials embedded within the cell membrane. In animal cells, there's cholesterol, and cholesterol in animal cell membranes provides varying degrees of rigidity. So in warm temperatures, if the body temperature of that animal goes up a little bit, the cholesterol restrains the phospholipids and prevents them from actually moving around. And maybe if they move around too much, they'll float away from each other and the cell membrane will disintegrate. So having the cholesterol there prevents that from happening. On the other hand, sometimes cells are exposed to lower temperatures. And in those cases, the cholesterol prevents close packing of phospholipids because if the phospholipids are too close to each other you won't be able to have diffusion of materials that can usually easily float through like carbon dioxide and oxygen. The glycocalyx is another feature of membranes. It's not really shown here in great detail but there are an awful lot of glycoproteins and there are even uh, glycolipids like what's shown here in green. This is actually the sugar part that's actually attached to the phospholipid just like this is the sugar part attached to the protein and what happens is it forms sort of this big matrix on the surface of the cell. It essentially forms a carbohydrate coat. The structure of these can vary. There are various short polysaccharide chains that are attached to membrane phospholipids and the function of this is to provide markers for cell to cell recognition once again so cells can recognize each other and this is really crucial for sorting embryo cells into tissues and organs this occurs particularly during embryonic development so that the cells know where they're supposed to go so that they can form a particular organ or a particular structure and when things go wrong here they can have devastating effects so it's really important that these cells can recognize each other and the glycocalyx is part of that. The other reason that these these uh, carbohydrates are important is that it allows the immune system to recognize body cells versus invading cells and it provides for the rejection of foreign cells by the immune system. That was an introduction to various cell membrane features and their functions.